Story 1. Kicking and Screaming The galaxy was ours for the taking. Humanity had finally mastered faster-than-light travel, and the universe awaited us with open arms. Or so we thought. Our first journeys brought puzzling discoveries, lush, verdant worlds capable of supporting life, yet all lifeless. Tables set for seven billion, yet not a soul in sight. It was like arriving at a party just as everyone else was leaving. But finally, we detected signs of civilization on a distant planet called Gallifrax. Sure enough, when we arrived, sprawling cities dotted the landscape bustling with activity. Strange beings shuffled about on six stubby legs. Slimy tentacles protruded from domed heads. We initiated first contact protocols. Our linguists toiled relentlessly until communication was established. The Gallifraxians, as they called themselves, welcomed us warmly. Eager to share knowledge, they transmitted data on science, philosophy, art, a trove of culture. We reciprocated, transmitting mankind's greatest works, the plays of Shakespeare, the music of Beethoven, the art of da Vinci. The Gallifraxians soaked it up like sponges. Then, disaster struck. A garbled message from Gallifrax, frantic in tone. Our universal translators could only pick out random words. Crisis, death, help. When the constellation arrived in orbit, the planet was engulfed in flames. Gallifraxian cities now smoldering ruins. We searched for survivors, but found only ashes. Another civilization lost just as contact was made. A devastating pattern emerged. Intelligence flourishing, progress accelerating, technology advancing, until extinction. Had we been cursed? Were we destined to always arrive too late? But we carried on, exploring, making contact. Each time, the result was the same. They perished just as we extended our hand in friendship. Why? The question haunted us. What fatal flaw did sentient species share? A predilection for self-destruction. We had to get to the bottom of the mystery. The next world showed promise. The inhabitants, called Zarconians, were primitive but peaceful. We kept our distance, observing from orbit, studying, solving their language. We would proceed with the utmost caution. But during the long voyage, they had already split the atom. War soon followed, as it always had on Earth. We could only watch helplessly as they annihilated themselves. That was the day humanity made a solemn vow. Never again would we stand idly by. The cycle must be broken. When the next world was discovered, we took a different approach. Making contact immediately, we gave them a simple message. Your salvation lies in the stars. We will help you reach them, but you must dismantle all weapons. Some complied, some resisted. But in the end, we would not allow another civilization to perish when the means to save them was within our grasp. Step by step, world by world, we uplifted them, compelled them to settle their differences, dismantle their arsenals, and work together. United in purpose, humanity brought peace, often through negotiation, sometimes by force, but always for their own good. Because if you have the power to save someone and choose not to, what does that make you? So the galaxy is ours now, though not exactly as we envisioned. The burden is heavy, but we will bear it. Because it turns out humanity's purpose among the stars is not to conquer or explore or meet new beings. It is to lead our fellow creatures into the future kicking and screaming if necessary. Story 2. The Void Runner The Void Runner dropped out of FTL on the outskirts of the unexplored system, its advanced sensors probing ahead. Captain Ida Keller watched closely for any signs of activity, ready to order an immediate jump if needed. You could never be too careful, even this far from the front. Scans picking up multiple worlds, Captain, reported her sensor officer. At least three look potentially habitable. No artificial transmissions or orbital constructs detected. Ida nodded. 
Take us in slowly. Activate the cometary halo and set condition yellow. Standard precautions for an unknown system. The ship's exterior display shifted to match the icy grains of a comet tail, while interior lighting dimmed to an alert level. The 12-person crew tensed, unsure what they would find here. Their mission was straightforward. Scout ahead of the colonial fleet, identify worlds suitable for terraforming and settlement. With the war against the alien Krillic going poorly, Earth desperately needed habitable real estate. Of course, habitable worlds were valuable to everyone. Approaching the inner system, sensors reported. One terrestrial world confirmed atmosphere and temperature within human norms. No artificial signals, but there are anomalous energy readings on the nightside surface. Could be anything, mused Ida. Geothermal activity, electrical storms, but her gut said otherwise. She glanced at her first officer. Looks like we may not be alone out here after all. Go to silent running and get us a closer look. Maximum magnification on those energy patterns. The Void Runner's emissions went dark as it glided inward, using gravity lenses to bend light around itself. The nightside anomaly resolved into a web of faint but regular lights marking the outlines of continents. Artificial lighting, no doubt about it, said Ida. Any local comms chatter? Negative. Scans show no EM emissions beyond the visible frequencies. Peculiar. Whoever was down there apparently utilized primitive lighting, yet avoided other detectable signals. Ida weighed the possibilities. All right, we need more information before we can risk direct contact. Launch a stealth satellite to observe activity on the planet. Soon, a high-resolution view filled the screens, an alien city of soaring towers and graceful arches. Eight-limbed inhabitants scuttled about on innumerable errands. Surrounding the city, an orderly network of farms and villages extended to the horizon. They look peaceful enough, mused the science officer, and fairly advanced, even without electronics. Could they be some sort of Amish analog species? Ida shook her head. I don't like it. A civilization using artificial lighting but no other technology. It doesn't add up. Keep scanning. Her unease was justified hours later when the satellite detected concealed underground bunkers surrounding the city, shielded from surface scans. They housed weapons unlike any ever cataloged, hybrid biological and nanotech nightmares. Ida immediately declared a lockdown. They may look peaceful, but this is clearly a military outpost. The primitive appearance is just a front. She addressed the crew gravely. We must assume these aliens have ill intent toward Earth and the fleet. Our only viable option is a preemptive strike to remove this threat. Her officers exchanged uneasy looks but offered no objections. The ensuing attack was swift and ruthless. One antimatter warhead vaporized the false city, ensuring minimal collateral damage. Mop-up kinetic missiles collapsed the underground bunkers, entombing their contents. Scans confirm no other sapient life in the system. With their task complete, the Void Runner jumped away to rejoin the fleet. Ida submitted a report detailing the successful strike against a hidden alien weapons facility. Military command was pleased, awarding commendations to the entire crew. Ida was promoted to Commodore and given command of a cruiser squadron. Initially, she felt only satisfaction at a job well done. In time, however, doubts began to creep in. Those gracefully arching towers, the bustling streets. What if the city had been real? The aliens never attacked or scrambled defenses. Was a preemptive strike truly justified? The weapons in the bunkers were concerning, but their mere presence did not prove hostile intent. She wondered if future first contacts would also end in fire. Her qualms deepened when the Void Runner's former science officer approached her, clearly distraught. Ma'am, I must confess, I falsified the scans of those alien bunkers. There were no weapons, no threat, just civilians. Ida stared, 
mouth agape. Why? He stared at the floor. The crew was on edge. I knew suggesting military targets would convince you to attack. I thought it was required for humanity's safety. You thought incinerating a city of unknown aliens was required for our safety? On what grounds? Isn't that what we do? He implored. The fleet's purpose is to expand for Earth by any means necessary. I assumed hostile intent from the aliens because... Because we always assume hostile intent, Ida finished. She sat heavily, head in hands. My God, what have we become? We're supposed to be explorers, pioneers, but lately... She shook her head bitterly. All we really do is destroy. The science officer faced a court-martial. Ida's recommendations ensured he kept his post, albeit demoted. She realized he was not solely to blame for an atrocity disguised as vigilance. In the privacy of her ready room, she wrote a personal message to Fleet Command. In it, she questioned the standing orders to treat all aliens as enemies until proven otherwise. Perhaps humanity's aggression had drawn the Krillic into war when cooperation was possible? She urged adopting new contact protocols built on openness, not fear. Of course, she knew her words would be branded naive, even dangerous. Her career likely ended here, but she was done following commands she felt were fundamentally wrong. Kind had to change course before any more innocent lives were destroyed in the name of protecting Earth. Ida knew what she witnessed in that lonely system was only the beginning, unless they chose a different path. She transmit the message, knowing it would likely be ignored. But the words were out there now. Maybe someday they would find the right ears. It was all she could do. Leaning back, she waited calmly for the MPs to arrive. She had finally made her choice. Right or wrong, she would live with the consequences. The fate of aliens unknown rested heavily upon her now. Whatever came next, her conscience was clear. 